Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a Mai Tai. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a glass of red wine, and on this week's episode, we will be detailing the Sashris King murders. This event was a combination of hatred for authority, rebelling against regulation, and a temper that led to the murder of three innocent people just for doing their job. So first, who was the sausage king? Stuart Alexander was born the middle child of three sons to Shirley May Perriott and Herman Tweedy Alexander in San Leandro, California. In 1993, after the death of his father, Alexander inherited the family business. The Santos Linguista factory and proclaimed himself the quote-unquote sausage king. Alexander's father, Tweedy, had been well-known in local and national business circles as a successful businessman and was recognized and renowned for making linguista sausage. Stephen Alexander, Stuart's older brother, was set to inherit the reins of the company, but after his death, it was inherited by Stuart instead. Tweedy had little faith that Stuart could run the company. He was also verbally abusive to Stuart, often telling him that he would, quote unquote, never amount to anything. According to Alexander's mother, who divorced Tweedy when Alexander was 10, Tweedy could at times be very demanding with his son and, quote unquote, yelled at him all the time, especially when, at times at the factory during summers and weekends, a young Alexander made a mistake. Coupled with this and the breakup of his parents' marriage in 1971, Alexander cultivated a deep-seated hatred and resentment from a young age that often manifested violently in relations with other people. Alexander, who was described by some who knew him closely to have a quote-unquote short fuse and to be at times quote-unquote combative, he was charged with beating Clifford Berg, who was a 75-year-old elderly neighbor of his after an argument in 1996. Alexander began a romantic relationship with Eve Elder, a 33-year-old insurance claims agent around 1995. Over the course of the relationship, Elder allegedly saw signs of resentment and a potential violent streak in Alexander, especially when commenting about inspectors. And what started out as a joke, the couple concocted a series of short stories. One titled, quote, Sausage Sniffers Found Sauce, end quote, painted a description of the inspectors drowning in vats of quote unquote secret sauce. As another former girlfriend, Charlotte Klepp, who was 38, who had been seeing Alexander on and off until the time of the murders would later testify during the murder trial, Alexander frequently used profanities to describe the inspectors and will become confrontational with them or towards anyone who he deemed as quote-unquote trespassers at his factory. He allegedly occasionally wielded a gun and kept several firearms in his office desk drawer. Over time, Alexander also began to cultivate an increasingly antagonistic and contentious relationship with the four inspectors who were regularly assigned to oversee his business operations in terms of, quote, cooking temperature, cleanliness, and other health concerns, end quote. Alexander felt that the inspectors were harassing him unnecessarily and, quote, interfering with the way his sausage was best made and had always been made by his family, end quote. By demanding that his linguisa be smoked at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which was a state and USDA requirement. Alexander, who usually smoked the linguisa at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, feared that the increased cooking temperature would shrink the sausages, thereby reducing the price at which he could sell them. There were also requirements about the type of smoker that could be used. His had been deemed antiquated and outdated. On at least two occasions, the inspectors ordered that the factory be shut down only for Alexander to reopen it against state law. Taking out bank loans to reopen the factory caused the once thriving, now illegally operated factory to lose more and more money. 
It was alleged by those who were close to him that Alexander would often keep and show off emails and letters from the meat compliance officers who he felt were harassing him. Perhaps partially inspired by the perceived harassment of the state and USDA inspection practices, Alexander made a bid for San Leandro mayoral office in 1998. The campaign failed when it was published that he had previously attacked an elderly neighbor. At the time leading up to the murders, Alexander posted a sign at the front of the factory stating, quote, to all our great customers, the USDA is coming into our plant harassing my employees and me, making it impossible to make our great product. Gee, if all meat plants could be in business for 79 years without one complaint, the meat inspectors would not have jobs. Therefore, we are taking legal action against them, end quote. On Wednesday, June 21st, 2000, four health inspectors arrived at the factory for an inspection. Jean Hillary, 56, and Tom Quadros, 52, were from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. William Shailene, 57, and Earl Willis, 51, were from the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Initially, Alexander was not at the factory as he was making a delivery. The inspectors were allowed inside by a factory worker. Later on, after returning to the factory, an angry Alexander confronted the inspectors and ordered them to leave. The inspectors called the police to provide protection for them, while Alexander made a phone call of his own to the police, accusing the inspectors of trespassing and demanding that they be removed. Both calls were treated as low priority. Willits waited outside the factory for the police to arrive while the other three inspectors remained inside the factory lobby. Shortly after, an angry but calm appearing Alexander went into his office and retrieved one of his guns from his office drawer, re-entered the lobby, and opened fire on the three inspectors. Willis, who heard the gunshots, immediately sprinted away from the factory. Alexander then exited the factory and chased after Willis, firing five shots in his direction but missing. A video recording of Alexander chasing Willis down the street was captured by a proprietor of a nearby business. Willis, who was unharmed, managed to escape to a nearby bank. After Alexander's failed attempt to shoot Willis, he returned to the factory and emptied three more shots into the heads of Hillary. Quadros and Shailene to make sure that they were dead. The police soon arrived upon the scene after someone in the bank notified the police department. Upon their arrival, Alexander was standing in front of the factory, admitted to the murders, and was ready to be taken into custody. On October 19, 2004, Alexander was convicted of three counts of first degree murder, making him eligible to receive the death penalty. On December 14, 2004, a jury condemned Alexander to death by lethal injection. He was convicted of the murders and sentenced to death officially on February 15, 2005. While awaiting execution on California's death row at San Quentin State Prison, Alexander, who had gained some 80 pounds during the four years in custody until his stay of execution, began to experience health problems. On Tuesday, December 27, 2005, Alexander was found dead in his prison cell. It was eventually determined that he had died from a pulmonary embolism. Jenny, what are your thoughts on the Sausage King murders? This is such a wild story. I mean, who would ever think something like this would ever happen, especially at a sausage factory of all places? And who would think people would be murdered over FDA standards? I had never heard of this case before. And I was kind of surprised because it is like fairly, like somewhat recent. But yeah, it's really upsetting to hear when people are just trying to do their jobs and then someone is pissed off. Aggressive, angry people like Alexander really scare me. <laughs> and I mean, it is sad to hear his how awful his father was to him and without a doubt I'm sure that molded him into the person he became we've talked a lot about that on the podcast about like nature versus nurture and how people and outside influences really do have an impact on people and like their mental state and their crimes sometimes 
I will talk about the FDA more soon. I mean, I generally like think that they're good because, you know, before we had the FDA and whatnot, people, wait, let me just make sure. I don't know when yet. Did, do you know if like Roosevelt started the FDA? I have to look. I know that in this case, it was the USDA, um, oh, okay. not the FDA. But I choose the FDA because they work in tandem a lot. And honestly, they have the most complaints when it comes to federal regulators, except for the IRS. But it's being weird saying through the IRS. Oh, okay. It says that Abe Lincoln did it, which is interesting. Okay, so I guess I'll shut up because I was going to say, like, you know how people in factories would literally be, like, peeing and, like, you couldn't wash your hands. Like, you'd pee, like, right next to the meat and then, like, put your hands back in the Yeah. It's sad seeing people just trying to do their jobs, and I don't know a ton about the USDA and the FDA, but it just makes me think about how, you know, like, during the Industrial Revolution and, like, early 1900s and whatnot, how there were really no, like, sanitary conditions, and unsanitary work conditions were going into people's food and whatnot. I know that temperature is a little different, but... I mean, I don't know what the right temperature to smoke a sausage is. I'm sure 30 degrees probably would make a difference. I don't know. But if you're keeping people safe, like, I don't know, to me, that doesn't seem like to ask someone to smoke their meat at a different temperature doesn't seem that big a deal. I mean, getting like a new smoker, yeah, I'm sure that is like time consuming and costly for him. And I'm sure as all of this harassment, whatever, from these inspectors, or this quote unquote harassment, I should say, from these inspectors was going on. I'm sure he had his dad's voice in the back of his head saying, like, you're not good enough. You're not going to do anything. You're going to run this business into the ground, this business that I've worked 79 years or whatever to build. So it's sad, but I mean, you can't go around killing people for trying to do their job. I don't know. Like, that's all I feel like that's all I can say. It's a wild story. What about you? I totally agree with you. The fact that three people were killed and a fourth person was shot at over regulations that they have no control over writing, they're just enforcing it. And you get killed over that? I think that while we can recognize the trauma that Alexander had been through in his life, nothing justifies killing three people because like you said you had to cook your sausages 30 degrees higher and honestly it wasn't even a quality related issue that he had it was a money thing he couldn't sell them for as much so that's even worse you killed three people because they wanted you to make sure that the products that you were giving to the community was safe and because of money and your own anger and your own trauma, you kill them for it. I understand that people have frustrations when they feel like rules are coming down on them and it's just so much. But I feel like that's the cost of business. If you want to be in the sausage making business, you need to follow the rules. And if you don't want to follow the rules, shut the business down. Give it to someone else. Sell the business. No one is forcing you to be in this business. You chose to do it. And by choosing to accept the inheritance of the factory, you chose to deal with regulators. That's just what you have to put up with. And I do think that there was a level of narcissism with Alexander because he just felt like the rules shouldn't apply to him, even though he wasn't being targeted, even though he thought he was. It was the fact that you're in this business. These are the rules. You need to follow them. The fact that you're not following them is the reason why you're getting so much attention from us. It's like one of those double-edged sword things where it's like you claim that we're harassing you claim that we keep coming to your business. But the reason why we keep coming to your business is because you keep opening up your business illegally after we tell you to shut it down. So it's just an all-around messed up situation and a disturbing case of someone letting their own ego and anger take over and claim the lives of innocent people. 
It definitely is ego. And even in that uh, statement that he put out to the customers, oh, we're being harassed and we give them jobs, but they're still coming after us. And we're just trying to make a great product for you all to consume. There's so much, yeah, like you said, ego. And that because of all of that, it's interesting that he did like, he admitted to the murders right away. You would think someone like him would try to defend himself to the very end. So I think it's interesting that he really gave himself up. So I definitely agree. And one thing that I did want to add was that all of the murders were actually caught on video because of the proclaimed harassment that he felt he was receiving. Alexander had set up a bunch of cameras throughout his factory, which he claimed was going to document the harassment. And so there was video proof, and he knew it, of him not just doing the initial shooting, but when he came back to the final bullet. That's crazy. He really was his own downfall. In every way, shape, and form. One of the main issues Alexander had with regulators was what he deemed to be unfair standards that the USDA and the state of California was holding his business to. While his reaction was one of extreme violence, many people have voiced concerns and others support federal regulators like the U.S., DA, FDA, and others. Congress frequently delegates authority to an executive branch agency to issue regulations to govern some sphere. The two main regulators of food products in the United States are the USDA and the FDA. The United States Department of Agriculture, or USDA, is the federal executive department responsible for developing and executing federal laws related to farming, forestry, rural economic development, and food. It aims to meet the needs of commercial farming and livestock food production, promotes agricultural trade and production, works to ensure food safety, protects natural resources, fosters rural communities, and works to end hunger in the United States and internationally. It is headed by the Secretary of Agriculture, who reports directly to the President of the United States and is a member of the President's Cabinet. Many of the programs concerned with the distribution of food and nutrition to the people of the U.S. and provides nourishment as well as nutrition education to those in need are run by the Food and Nutrition Service, which is under the USDA. Activities in this program include the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, which provides healthy food to over 40 million low-income and homeless people each month. The USDA is also concerned with assisting farmers and food producers with the sale of crops and food on both the domestic and world markets. It plays a role in overseas aid program by providing surplus food to developing countries. This aid can go through the U.S. aid, foreign governments, international bodies such as the World Food Program, or approved nonprofits. The United States Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, or U.S. FDA, is a federal agency of the Department of Health and Human Services. The FDA is responsible for protecting and promoting public health through the control and supervision of food safety, tobacco products, dietary supplements, prescription and over-the-counter pharmaceutical drugs, medications, vaccines, biopharmaceuticals, blood transfusions, medical devices, electromagnetic radiation emitting devices or EREDs, cosmetics, animal food and feed and veterinary products. The FDA is led by the Commissioner of Food and Drugs appointed by the President with the advice and consent of the Senate. The Commissioner reports to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. As of 2021, the FDA had responsibility for overseeing $2.7 trillion in food, medicine, and tobacco products. Before we get into the criticism of federal regulators, Jenny, what is your overall opinion on regulation and regulators' role in society? I do think regulation is good. I'm not someone that really trusts, I guess, businesses and corporations to like catch themselves and watch themselves because 
we've said this how many times, profits over people all the time with a lot of these companies. So I think keeping things in check for the environment, for people's safety is a good thing. I will say I feel like it's not always done correctly. And I think a lot of stuff falls through the cracks for various reasons. But I think it has a role. It's meant to help people. And I'm happy with regulations in place. What about you? I definitely agree with you. I think that regulation is a really important part of a functioning society. Because like you said, we cannot trust corporations to do what's in the interest of public safety. And honestly, it's not their jobs to. That's the government's job. It's the government's job to make sure that the products and services that are available within the borders of the United States are ones that are not going to be actively harmful. Now, of course, there is a balance to it. There's always a debate around the availability of certain drugs and certain products. But I think that what a good set of regulations does is balance the freedoms that we all strive to have as Americans with reasonable safety standards and protocols that producers of various consumer products have to follow. Well said. There have been many criticisms of federal regulation of the FDA. The economist Milton Friedman has claimed that the regulatory process is inherently biased against approval of some worthy drugs because the adverse effects of wrongfully banning a useful drug are undetectable, while the consequences of mistakenly approving a harmful drug are highly publicized and that therefore the FDA will take the action that will result in the least public condemnation of the FDA regardless of the health consequences. Economist Gary S. Becker, who won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics, has argued that FDA-required clinical trials for new drugs do contribute to high drug prices for consumers, mainly because of patent protection that provides a temporary monopoly which disallows cheaper alternatives from entering the market. Advocates dropping many FDA requirements, many of which provide no additional safety or valuable information as this would hasten the development of new drugs because they would be faster to bring to market, thereby increasing supply and as a consequence would lead to lower prices. Some critics believe that the FDA has been apt to overlook safety concerns in approving new drugs and is slow to withdraw approved drugs once evidence shows them to be unsafe. Resilin and Viox are high-profile examples of drugs approved by the FDA which were later withdrawn from the market for posing unacceptable risks to patients. Food safety advocates have criticized the FDA for allowing meat manufacturers to use carbon monoxide gas mixtures during the packaging process to prevent discoloration of meat, a process that may hide signs of spoilage from the consumer. The FDA has also been criticized for permitting the routine use of antibiotics in healthy domestic animals to promote their growth, a practice which allegedly contributes to the evolution of antibiotic-resistant strains of bacteria. The FDA has received criticism for its approval of certain coal tar-derived food dyes, such as FDC Yellow 5 and 6, which are banned in most European countries. The FDA has also been criticized for giving permission for cloned animals to be sold as food without any special labeling, Although, quote, cloned products may not reach the U.S. market for years, end quote. And, quote, authorities lack the authority to require a labeling of products from cloned animals, end quote. In a 2005 interview, Dr. David Graham, Associate Director of the FDA's Office of Drug Safety, stated that, quote, the FDA is inherently biased in favor of the pharmaceutical industry. It views the industry as its client, whose interests it must represent and advance. It views its primary mission as approving as many drugs as it can, regardless of whether the drugs are safe or needed, end quote. The supporters of medical cannabis legalization criticized the FDA's statement as a politically motivated one instead of one that's based on uh, solid science. 
In April of 2005, the FDA issued a statement asserting that cannabis had no medicinal value and should not be accepted as a medicine, despite a great deal of research suggesting the opposite. A $1.8 million 2006 Institute of Medicine report on pharmaceutical regulation in the United States found major deficiencies in the FDA's system for ensuring the safety of drugs on the American market. Overall, the authors of the report call for an increase in the regulatory powers funding and independence of the FDA. The USDA has not been immune from criticism, mostly around discrimination. Allegations have been made that throughout the agency's history, its personnel have discriminated against farmers of various backgrounds denying them loans and access to other programs well into the 1990s. The effect of this discrimination has been the reduction in the number of African-American farmers in the United States. Though African-American farmers have been hit the most by discriminatory actions by the USDA, women, Native Americans, Hispanics, and other minority groups have experienced discrimination in a variety of forms at the hands of the USDA. The majority of these discriminatory actions have occurred through the Farm Service Agency, which oversees loans and assistance programs to farmers. A March 17, 2006 letter from the GAO about the pig for settlement indicated that, quote, the court noted that USDA disbanded its Office of Civil Rights in 1983 and stopped responding to claims of discrimination, end quote. In the 1999 Pigford v. Glickman class action lawsuit brought by African-American farmers, the USDA agreed to a billion-dollar settlement due to its patterns of discrimination in the granting of loans and subsidies to Black farmers. In 2011, a second round of payouts Pigford II was appropriated by Congress for $1.25 billion, although this payout far too late to support the many who desperately needed financial assistance during the 1999 lawsuit only comes out to around $250,000 per farmer. Also in 1999, Native American farmers discriminated in a similar fashion to Black farmers filed a class action lawsuit against the FDA alleging loan discrimination under the ECOA in the APA. This case relied heavily on its predecessors, Pigford versus Glickman. In terms of the reasoning, it set forth in the lawsuit. Eventually, a settlement was reached between the plaintiffs and the USDA to the amount of up to $760 million, awardable through individual damages claims. These claims could be used for monetary relief, debt relief, and or tax relief. The filing period began June 29, 2011 and lasted 180 days. In 2000, similar to Pigford v. Glickman, a class action lawsuit was filed in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia on behalf of Hispanic farmers alleging that the USDA discriminated against them in terms of credit transactions and disaster benefits. In direct violation of ECOA, as per the moment, $1.33 billion is available for compensation in awards of up to $50,000 or $250,000, while an additional $160 million is available in debt relief. In 2001, similar to Garcia v. Vilsack, a class action lawsuit was filed in the same court alleging discrimination on the basis of gender. A congressional response to the lawsuit resulted in the passing of the Equality for Women Farmers Act, which created a system that would allow for allegations of gender discrimination to be heard against the USDA and enable claims for damage. Jenny, what are your thoughts on the criticisms of the FDA and the discrimination claims made against the USDA? The criticisms make total sense to me. I mean, if they're going to spend time and money with some of these regulations that really have no benefit to anyone, like, what's the point? And I think everyone would appreciate lower-cost drugs. And just hearing, like, oh, some company can have a monopoly on something and then, like, a generic product can't get created as fast is pretty gross, to say the least, in my opinion. It's interesting how, like, varied the criticisms are, too. 
I know we talked probably a little bit about the FDA within the thalidomide disaster episode. If you're interested in hearing about that, definitely check that out. I've heard um, the criticisms about the FDA and cannabis before. I don't know if it's the FDA or if it was another administration or organization, but I have heard that the funding that they get around cannabis is only to research its negative effects. So like we had said, there is a lot of research that suggests that cannabis is really good and helpful for various conditions, mental health. I think it can be helpful with patients with cancer and epilepsy, all types of things. And to see it really just being stopped is upsetting. And I think that's where a lot of distrust in the government with these criticisms and claims of discrimination, you know, like that's where it comes into place. And that's why I think part of why people don't like regulation because it's in place to do something. And then there's all this like red tape or it's like really not doing its job. And it's just kind of like a waste of money in some cases, like I said. The farmer thing is really upsetting too. I don't know a ton about like the agriculture industry or farming, but who hasn't seen those bumper stickers that say, save our farmers or like thank a farmer because of what you're eating. And it just kind of worries me hearing stuff like that, how these probably smaller independent farmers are really getting screwed and they're not able to keep their company, their businesses, their livelihood afloat. And then I think that also kind of leads to like monopolies in the food industry, which is really not good either. So all very valid. And I'm glad we're talking about this because I didn't know about a lot of this stuff. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that anytime you have a agency admitting that the pharmaceutical and uh, industry is their clients and their partners, and they're going to do anything to bolster them, you have an issue. And I think that that bleeds into everything else that the FDA does, where they are going into it from a lens of how is this going to help or hurt the pharmaceutical industry, which is a cluster that is known for wanting to suppress like marijuana legalization, for example. I do think that it's interesting, like you were saying, how varied the criticism of the FDA is. I think that that could be related to how many different things they do. And so for me, that does raise the question of, is the FDA tasked with regulating too many different industries? And would it be a better system to break some of those down into maybe sub-agencies or give some of those regulatory actions to other things? especially when you have a situation where you are creating a lot of conflicts of interest. When it comes to the USDA, it seems that they just had an unwritten policy of discrimination. And it's definitely sad to hear that at some point in 1983, they just disbanded their Office of Civil Rights. And I think that that shows that they didn't really care. It doesn't make any sense to disband that office, especially when you knew that you had ongoing problems with discrimination that resulted in multiple lawsuits. And I know that that is something that is currently being talked about. How can we better support farmers who come from a minority background? And how can we get more people interested in farming? Because like you said, you do see the banners of save our farms, save our farmers. And I don't think that the USDA is doing anything to promote family farms, small scale farms. Because again, it goes back to who are the people that have the power to lobby on behalf of like the USDA's budget and its focus. And those are the larger factory farms, the large scale farming operations. And so I don't know how many more lawsuits the USDA needs to get for them to understand that you cannot discriminate against anyone. But unfortunately, I don't think this is going to be the last time we talk about the USDA. 
and the FDA crossing the line and not doing what needs to be done in the best interest of the American public because their ultimate goal, of course, should be promoting public safety and making sure that the companies under their purview are doing what's best. You made a good point, too, about like factory farming stuff. So they're getting, to me, this is one of those things that just extends out to so many other issues. So like with factory farming, if they're clearly like investing more in them and not helping out these smaller farmers, we know that factory farms and like that big agriculture is very harsh on the environment. And I'm sure much harsher than it would be with the other farmers. It's a whole other issue in itself. And you would think someone agency with agriculture in its name would try to invest and research and look into more sustainable practices and award people for sustainable practices. But I'm sure maybe that's happening to an extent, but I don't know what extent that is. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I think what else happens is they're pumping so much money and honestly power into those factory farms and the larger scale operations that they become the people to set the standard of what is acceptable. And as we know, their standards are horrendous. And the things that they do to not just the animals, but their workers is not standards that we would want to be what is considered the best way to go for the industry across the nation. And then it becomes a thing of their products being much cheaper because if you don't want to follow that practice, you have a much more expensive operation, thus means you have to charge more. And so it just becomes this really bad cycle of the USDA not stepping in to change anything, factory farms get more disgusting and exploitative, um, in my opinion, and small scale farms and minority farmers just get the shaft. Absolutely. If you learn anything from this episode, try to go to the farmer's market, shop local because it is overall better for the environment and you are helping out a smaller scale farm probably more likelihood that it is like minority owned farm too nothing probably better quality than what you're going to get at the average supermarket that wraps up this week's case thank you for listening let us know in the comments what you think about the sausage king murders you can read more about this case and how to support it in the links below we will be back next week with our 100th episode decided on by you. As always, stay safe.